good morning and a very warm welcome to everyone who is with us for worship this morning either gathered here in our sanctuary or tuning in remotely from wherever you might be welcome to all it is good to be together and we know that God is with us always wherever we are and that God's love unites us as we worship today for those of you who may not know me, my name is Judy Campbell. I am a retired United Church minister and a volunteer associate minister here at Trinity. But first, as we move into our worship service, let us acknowledge on whose land we are grateful to be gathering. For thousands of years, Indigenous people have walked on this land. The relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. As we come into worship, we recognize that Trinity United Church is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Arawandarump peoples who have cared for this land since time immemorial. The community of Ingersoll is represented by both the Between the Lakes Treaty of 1792 and the London Township Treaty of 1796. As we gather, we are mindful of the broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with our relations. As treaty people, we commit to listen, learn, and work toward justice and reconciliation. Now, I know that the announcements have been um, given to you on a handout bulletin for you to take home and running on the screen. Um, but are there any further announcements? I think Marianne has an announcement for us today. I'm really excited about this Jars of Joy fundraiser, can't you tell? And I do want to get your creative juices flowing. So um, the CD committee is excited to offer the jo Jars of Joy fundraiser. I just carried two boxes of jars in. Um, we're hoping that you will all participate by donating a jar if you are able and of course buying tickets to win a jar of joy for your very own and the details for those will come during our kickoff on October 9th and the jars will also be available then or of course you can use your own. At this point we are still just asking you to put on your thinking caps and keep your eyes open for items that would fit into a mason type jar. We're looking for filled jars that appeal to everyone, men, women, children, all ages. Um, think about those teens, think people that maybe are a little bit harder to entice. You can buy items, make items, or offer unique gift certificates. The sky is the limit, or should I say the jar is the limit. Be creative, think about what would give you joy, and get ready to share joy as we celebrate Thanksgiving and prepare for the Advent season. Jars will be due back by November 6th, so you have time. If you have any questions, please feel free to talk to somebody on the CD committee. Thanks. Thank you, Marianne. And I have an announcement about our service this morning and some related changes. Trinity United Church was to have hosted a weekend learning event this weekend entitled Discipleship for Earth Healing, hosted by Oxford United Ministries, funded by the Hope Council and Oxford Legacy Fund, and led and presented by eco-theologian, the Reverend Dr. Jessica Hetherington, who would have, on Friday evening and yesterday and Saturday, led the participants in a time of learning and spiritual engagement about our place in creation how we can deepen our discipleship response to the ecological crisis and climate change. The weekend would have concluded with this worship service this morning, a regular service of worship with all welcome, whether involved with the weekend event or not, and with Jessica preaching. However, that all changed over the past week. The weekend event had to be canceled when Jessica tested positive for COVID this past week. And she lives in Ottawa and was just unable to get here. She wasn't feeling well. The Eco Theology Committee have rescheduled the event 
to Friday, November 4th and Saturday, November 5th, and they will be sending out a revised schedule soon to those who were registered. Today, though, Reverend Jessica, Reverend Dr. Jessica Hetherington will still be here as our preacher with a pre-taped message entitled, Who is Our Neighbor? She will begin her message by reading her chosen scriptures for that message. And so I am going to introduce Jessica as I would if she were here. The Reverend Dr. Jessica Hetherington is an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada. She holds a PhD in theology from St. Paul University with a specialization in ecology and theology. She is passionate about exploring with others the ways in which God is calling us to respond to the ecological crisis and how we can do so in ways that are effective and transformative. Jessica has written, being in a worshiping community together, praying and singing our praise to God, breaking bread together at communion, this all fills us up and feeds us so that we are encouraged and empowered to go out and seek the concrete change to mitigate the worst of global warming and live together more sustainably. Born and raised in the Ottawa Valley, Jessica now lives in Ottawa with her spouse, Mark, and their family. And I also want to at this time thank all the many people, seen and behind the scenes, who have given their time and expertise getting this service, the original one and then the revised one, put together and communicated to all the necessary people. The Eco-Theology Committee of Lynn Dunlop, Lori Mindler, Mark Murray, and Glenn Wright, and our gifted musical people here, and technical people, and the staff here at Trinity for making it possible for us to worship together today. And now, in preparation for worship this morning, let us sing together More Voices number 27, Creator God, You Gave Us Life. We will sing verse 2 and the chorus. And as we sing, the Christ candle will be lit, symbolizing the guiding presence of the Christ always with us wherever we may be, connecting us as one in love and spirit of the Creator. going to get that done before the singing stopped. <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship and your responses are indicated. Oh God, we come before you today in hope. We come before you as disciples learning to act in the ways of justice and peace. Fill us in our time of worship today. So that we may go out and live our faith in action. And the prayer of approach today is a prayer that is written by the Reverend Dr. Jessica Hetherington. Let us pray. O oh God, our Creator, we come before you this morning in worship and praise, in longing and anticipation. We wait to hear your word broken open and in so doing, to be broken open ourselves. 
Incarnate God, please ready us now so that it is you we hear and not our own voices projected onto you. Holy Spirit, empower us now to enter fully into worship and to lead later, transformed and ready to live out your love and wisdom. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. And our opening hymn is More Voices, number 30. It's a song of praise to the Maker. Dunlop has a wonderful lesson for the young and the young at heart. And while you're coming up, I think I'll light the altar candles. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, if you, I have a quiz for you, so you'll need to sit there. Sorry about that. <laughs> We have chairs. We may need one, two more, maybe right here. How's that? How's school going? Great, yes. Learning is wonderful, isn't it? 
uh, I'm an old teacher, as, as in former uh, teacher, and, and so uh, I have brought a quiz for you today. It's going to be on screen, and uh, if we can move, it's called Touch the Earth Lightly, and we'll talk in a few minutes about what that means. Uh, but let's begin with our first question. And so what I will do, uh, if you re we'll read it through, and I'll take one answer, and then I'll give my answer. How's that? Which of these items cannot be recycled? Cardboard and paper, metal, plastic bottles, or light bulbs? Any thought? Okay, that's... We'll go with that answer. Now, now I'll give uh, what I have learned. Um, I had to do some studying on this. And so light bulbs is actually the one thing that can't be recycled fully because there are so many different parts inside them. Uh, and uh, because they emit 6% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions, I was surprised by that, uh, what we can do, although we can't recycle, is, is to move towards uh, LED light bulbs and things like that. They last longer. Next question. So maybe if you can just keep track on your fingers of uh, how many answers you, you got right in your head. 85% of the Earth's land animals and plants live on mountains or in forests or in deserts or in open spaces. Forests, that's right. Uh, because forests uh, have water and sunlight and shelter. So one thing we need to do is always keep in mind as we see trees and forests coming down, what, what's that doing to our plants and animals? Uh, next. <clears throat> How long does it take styrofoam to decompose? One year, 50 years, 100 years, 500 years? And I felt guilty even bringing this into your church, but I wanted to show you styrofoam. Yes. Uh, you know what? It's even longer than that. I was surprised. It's actually 500 years. Um, I, and so we can't even measure ac uh, um, totally because we haven't been through 500 years since they developed it. But, but they know that it just takes so long in the landfill sites. And it's one thing that we can't recycle fully. Uh, there are uh, pieces of equipment that can help do it, but they're extremely expensive. So the idea is not to use it. I remember that Trinity United uh, years ago was the first church that I ever encountered that asked us not to bring uh, plastic bottles into the church. And that was because of your young people. And I, I've never forgotten that. Next. Can you identify these Canadian endangered species? So what I'm going to do is show you a picture of the, the item. And you, you probably will not know the exact uh, one that is endangered. But if you can give me the species, that's what we'll go for. First picture. Oh, yes. It's an owl. Very good. And this one is a burrowing owl. It lives in the prairies, and it's only about this high. And rather than being in trees, it burrows into the ground. And so you can imagine that as people are harvesting, uh, tilling the land, harvesting, etc., uh, they're, they're starting to lose their nesting areas. Next. Ooh, this is a difficult one. Ooh, it's a badger. Good for you. And the badger is uh, part of the weasel family. So this is actually the American badger, but it lives in southwestern Ontario. And, and it lives just north of uh, Lake Erie. And it's down to very few pairs uh, for mating and, and for continuing on. Part of it is because of uh, vehicles hitting them and other creatures uh, killing them. And they don't have passports, so they can't get across the border to meet up with other American badgers to keep going. Uh, next. This is uh, three petaled and white with green background. We know it's a flower, just the type of flower. Anybody? 
trillium, very good. And this is called the drooping trillium, and, there are on, and it's uh, only found in southwestern Ontario, and it's only found now in two areas. One is Middlesex County, which I think is right that direction, that's London area, and the other is in Elgin County. They're in two reserves in those areas. Uh, one more. Oh, yes. Who has not? Yes. Turtle, good for you. And you'll see the spots on it, yellow and orange, and these are found again in uh, Ontario. And uh, again, I, I have to look up how many. I have forgotten this. So it's only 13 centimeters long, which is like that, I think. Is that five inches? Uh, it has a smooth black shell, orange, yellow spots. And there are only 2,000 to 3,000 adults left in uh, Canada. Uh, and part of that is because of illegal animal poaching. People want them for their own terrariums as well. There's a word, terrarium. Uh, next, final one. OK, yes, fish, that's right. And that is the Atlantic salmon. And, and that is a fish that, can, that lives in both fresh water and salt water, uh, but they too are losing some of their area partially, partially because of dams and uh, culverts that we have uh, built, and uh, they are being uh, infected by invaded species as well. So finally, we go back to the title of my quiz, Touch the Earth Lightly. Do you have uh, your ideas on what that might mean in your world? Yeah. Don't kill animals and protect them. Anything else? Beyond animals, what else? Don't litter. Good idea, don't litter. Don't hurt wildlife. Right. Thank you, and, and so I want to, this is a song that we're going to be singing a little later, and so I wanted to just share the first verse with you. This is the uh, person who wrote this, this was their idea. Touch the earth lightly, use the earth gently, nourish the life of the world in our care. Thank you very much for coming to the front today. I know that you're going to be uh, heading out with Reverend uh, Tracy for Sunday School, and uh, if we can do a prayer together before you leave, uh, if I could begin and, and then you could repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful world. Help us to love the earth as you do. Help us to care deeply for all creation. Amen. Thank you for coming forward. Lovely to see you. Have a great week at school. Thank you, Lynn. I think we all learned a few things. That was great. Now, I think the choir had choir has a wonderful anthem for us.
Thank you, Susan and Kenny and the choir for such a beautiful and such an appropriate hymn for today. Thank you. And now we are going to have our guest preacher speaking to us. Our first reading comes from Our first reading comes from Leviticus chapter 19 verses 1 to 4 and 15 to 18 The Lord spoke to Moses saying speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. You shall each revere your mother and father, and you shall keep my Sabbath. I am the Lord, your God. Do not turn to idols or make cast images for yourselves. I am the Lord, your God. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. And you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And our gospel reading tonight comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12 verses 28 to 34. One of the scribes came near and heard him dis them disputing with one another. And seeing that, he answered them well. He asked them, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of life, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our minds and hearts lead us the deeper understanding of you and the love you call us to live. Amen. <clears throat> There's a lovely crabapple tree in my backyard, right outside my kitchen window. 
And in the spring, its gorgeous pink blossoms absolutely fill that window. My family and I watch them carefully, and we try to guess just which day the tree will be at its fullest bloom. We know when that day is, because on the very next day, the blossoms just don't seem quite so full. It's, it's a really, an, it's an amazing experience. It just, it's, it's a sense. It's very subtle, but it's beautiful. And, and every year we do this. I have known that tree longer than I have known my three younger children. As my children have grown, each of them, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> each of them likes to climb the crabapple tree. They always need some help getting onto the lowest branch, but then they climb up and they enjoy the vantage point over the back hedge. The tree doesn't seem to mind. It is also home to cardinals, chickadees, and sparrows, as well as black, gray, and red squirrels. All of these creatures are fed from this crabapple tree. The apples are tiny, they're just ornamental, so I cannot gather them for jelly. But they are the most nourishing food for the birds and the squirrels. I love that crabapple tree. Its branches are bare now, lying dormant as we move into winter. But I know, as well as I know the rhythms in my own body, that buds will return in the spring and I will watch them unfurl, some into leaves, some into blossoms, that will once again turn the air and the yard pink with beauty. I feel a real sense of kinship, that crabapple tree. That crabapple tree is a part of my home. It has stood tall over my babies as they have grown. It is something of beauty and nourishment and nurturing for birds and squirrels, for me and my family. I feel a sense of kinship, and it makes me ask the question, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? This is a question that has been asked throughout our faith tradition too. It is a question that has been asked and answered based upon the context facing, facing our faith siblings in different times and places. In the reading from Leviticus that we heard today, God, through Moses, tells the Israelites that they are to love their neighbors as themselves. God speaks into the context of that time to emphasize what love should look like. Be fair and impartial in your dealings. Do not slander others or profit from the misfortune of others. Do not have hate or vengeance or bear grudges against others. God spells out the way that love is to be lived out in our relationships with others. In that era, this commandment was interpreted to be in relation to one's kin, as well as those in their community. This is a central text that spells out who is our neighbor and what loving our neighbor is to mean in the time and place of the ancient Israelites. Then, in first century Palestine, Jesus widens the context for who our neighbor is, as well as widening our understanding of what it means to love our neighbor. We are reminded in the Gospel of Mark text that we are to once again love our neighbor as ourselves. Through the telling of the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke, Jesus shows us that our neighbor includes not only our family and our community, but includes outsiders, includes strangers. Through that parable, as well as evidence throughout Jesus' ministry, we see the context for who our neighbor is widened to include outsiders, outcasts, the marginalized, and the poor. And loving our neighbors is to include actively caring for them, as the Samaritan does with the, for the man who has been beaten and robbed. Loving our neighbors is to show compassion, mercy, care, and justice. We learn from the ministry of Jesus that there is no person who is not our neighbor. We also learn from the passage in Mark that the commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves is bound up with the commandment to love God. In this way, Jesus has reframed the commandment so that loving our neighbor is now central to our discipleship. 
if we are not loving God and our neighbor, we are not being followers of Jesus Christ. Who is my neighbor? I now know that there is no one who is not my neighbor. They include kin and community, stranger and the marginalized. And how am I to love my neighbor? Through respect and fair dealing, avoiding grudges or hard feelings, through acts of care, compassion, mercy, and justice. Loving my neighbor, I have discovered, is central to my discipleship. As we know, our scripture texts speak into specific contexts of time and place, which is why we see this development and shifting emphasis in Leviticus and then in Mark. But what about today? What is the context of time and place in which we continue to ask the question, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor today? And how am I to love them? Today we are living in a context in which the world is better known to us through the advancement of scientific knowledge. We know more now than we did in biblical times about the earth and our place in it. We are also living in a context of ecological crisis. Our power in the world has led to human-caused destruction of habitats, waterways, depleted soil, species extinction, and an utterly catastrophic climate crisis. In this context of both scientific knowledge of the earth an ecological crisis, who is my neighbor? My neighbor now is not just human. My neighbor now is not just the marginalized and poor in the human community, nor just my human relatives and the community in which I live. My neighbor now includes the non-human or other than human world around me. We know from science that humans are interconnected with and interdependent upon the ecosystems within which we live. We are not separate from nor superior to the rest of the natural world. We are mammals, fully animal, living in ecological relationship with the flora and fauna, the water, air, and soil. We are as I preached before, quite literally cousin with every single thing on the planet. All that exists on this earth, all of it, including you and me, came into existence at the moment of the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. This does not mean that we are all the same. Just like you and I are different, so am I different from a snake or a snail a rock or a flower. However, all exists as part of God's creation. All exists because of our Creator, and all is made for the purpose of God. All of creation exists with a purpose and a subjectivity that is beyond, outside of, human purposes. And all of it is our neighbor. When we look at the scriptures teaching us to love our neighbor as ourselves, we will notice that there are no restrictions ever given on who our neighbor is. People have interpreted the Leviticus text to be speaking primarily about kin and community, but that distinction is not actually defined by God. And Jesus refuses to set any limits on who our human neighbors are. In fact, in story after story of healing and love, Jesus insists on reaching out to the lowly, the downtrodden. He refuses to set any distinctions about who is or is not our neighbor. So now I know, nature is my neighbor. The non-human world around me is also my neighbor. How am I to love nature as my neighbor? How am I to love nature as myself? It is right there 
in our scripture readings from today and throughout Jesus' ministry. We are to pay attention to our neighbor. We are to notice, attend, listen, and know the other. Know them for who they are, not for what they can do for us. If we don't know the other, how can we love them? Theologian Sally McFaig tells us that we will not care for that which we do not love, and we cannot love that which we do not know. This means that in order to love nature as our neighbor, to love the natural world as ourselves, we must come to know the species around us, the flora and the fauna, the waterways and the soils, in their specificity and in their own right, outside of and beyond what they might mean for us or for our youth. So the context of who my neighbor is and how I am to love them has widened yet again. It has widened to include not just my kin and community, not just the poor and marginalized humanity. It has now widened to include the other-than-human world in which I am immersed. How I am to love them has also widened to include learning about that world in its, in its subjective details. The commandment to love my non-human neighbor is part of the discipleship demand that is made on my life as a Christian. So what does that look like? What does it really mean for me and how I live my life? Let's go back to that crabapple tree that grows in my backyard. That crabapple tree that holds birds and squirrels, holds my children and brings forth flowers in the spring and fruit in the summer. That crabapple tree is indeed my neighbor and I am called to love it as myself. I am called to respect it, care for it, and to come to know it better, what it is and what it needs. To flourish. What does loving my non-human neighbor look like? There are several threatened and endangered species in my community. One of them is a bird called the least bittern. The least bittern is the smallest member of the heron family, and it is threatened with extinction due to the destruction of its wetland habitat. The least bittern is at risk it is a neighbor that is in need right now. The leaf bittern is my neighbor, and I am called to love it as myself. A watershed is an area of land defined by the waters of that area, the streams and rivers, as well as surface water from rain, snow, and ice that move and drain into a larger body of water, such as a river or an ocean. It is an ecological system that is defined by these living waters. The flora and fauna, the way that the, land shape, the landscape is formed, etc. Watersheds, watersheds, by definition, shape where we live and how we live in every conceivable way. It is in this watershed that I live and move and have my being. It is in this watershed that I have been raised and in which I, I am raising my children. In this ecosystem, I have been shaped and sustained. It is independent of me. It is a subjective reality that does not exist solely for my use or need. The Ottawa River watershed is my neighbor and I am called to love it as myself. These are but three examples of the other than human world that I'm called to love as my neighbor. Each exists outside of me. The crabapple tree is my nearest neighbor, one that I'm already in relationship with. The leaf bittern is my neighbor that needs my active care right now, threatened due to ecological crisis. And the Ottawa River watershed is my neighbor within whom I am in a deeper relationship of interdependence and interconnection. 
Who is your neighbor? Who are the non-human neighbors in your life? I invite you to begin to think about them. You may begin by noticing the flora and fauna that is most familiar to you where you live. You may also want to look up what species are endangered or threatened in your area right now. Simply by looking them up and learning, you are beginning to love your non-human neighbors. And for those of you who are living in Oxford County, you are in the Grand River watershed. And I invite you to learn more about the watershed in which you live. Come to know it and love it as your neighbor. My friends, the great commandment is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is the discipleship call. We have learned today that there are truly no limits on who, who our neighbor is or on how we are to love them. I invite you today to lean into the call to love nature as our neighbor, to come to know and care for the non-human neighbors that we live with and among. I invite you to do so and allow that love and care to shape you, mold you deeper as a disciple of Jesus Christ. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Thank you to Reverend Dr. Jessica, who has now introduced us all to some new neighbors and what we need to do about that. So that, we'll make sure that we pass our thanks on to Jessica. Uh, we are now going to sing uh, Voices United, number 307, Touch the Earth Lightly, the hymn that Lynn introduced in her time with, with the, the, the young at heart. created by God to participate responsibly and generously in God's good creation and with all creatures living and sharing in it. 
We are to participate in healing creation, integrating the work of justice with our faith. And our offerings are one way in which we can respond to the Creator's call. The offering will now be received, and today I think the offering plates are going to be passed. They're just, am I right? Yes, okay. generous creator you gave us all of creation and asked us to be stewards of it accept and bless our gifts use them and us in the work of grateful stewardship amen please be seated and let us continue in prayer God of love, you have created us and all that is good. You have loved us into life, set us free. You have spoken your word, shown us your way, called us to follow, and upheld us through good times and bad. We are thankful for the world we live in, the blessings of creation that are ours to enjoy and care for, and we are now thankful for new visions of how we are to do that. For these things and so much more, we praise you, God, and thank you. As your people, we know the possibility of new life that emerges from dark times. And so we pray for the hurting places of your world. 
We pray for the leaders of nations that they may keep your vision of peace, justice, and ecological health alive. We pray for a world where all will have a roof over their heads, clothes on their back, and food so as not to go hungry. We pray for a world in which everyone will feel safe and secure from conflict, terrorism, abuse, and hate. For those who are trapped in poverty or torn apart by anger, hurt, or bitterness. And for those living in conditions of war and destruction. And we hold in ongoing prayer the people of Ukraine. We pray for the indigenous people of this land, the victims and families of residential school systems and other injustices revealed. We pray for those suffering enormous loss and destruction from weather conditions related to climate change, most recently trop Tropical Storm Fiona and Hurricane Ian. We pray for the victims struggling to recover and rebuild the first responders, the military personnel, and all who are responding with help. We pray for people still affected in so many ways by the COVID virus and its variants. And today we name aloud Reverend Dr. Jessica Hetherington and her family, and we pray for your healing love to surround them at this time. We pray for our friends and our families for those who are sick in hospital or grieving, and for those people and concerns brought to you now in the silence of our hearts. Strengthen and encourage them with your peace and healing presence. With thankful hearts, we gather these and all our prayers, turning to you in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, given the time, uh, we will have a short time of greeting one another with the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Do that if you'd like to. <laughs> Closing hymn this morning is from More Voices, number 135, Called by Earth and Sky.
us go from this place and into the world with a benediction written by Reverend Dr. Jessica Hetherington for us today. We are being sent out into the world now with God's greatest commandment placed on our hearts to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors, our human and non-human neighbors, as ourselves. We are being sent out into the world now, knowing there is no one and no thing in God's creation who is not our neighbor. So let us go and indeed love. Let us go and be stretched in our loving so that our love of God and the natural world may bring healing to all. And as we go, know that we go not alone, but with God, our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer, in deep relationship with all that is around us, this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 